Welcome to The Owl Hoot, a podcast for the environmentally curious, with me, Caroline Norbury. On each episode, I chat with a guest who contributes in some way to protecting the planet on matters of climate change, sustainability, biodiversity and pollution. Here is a place where you can gain new knowledge and be inspired. Enjoy listening. Today I am talking to Morella Perez, an eco-social entrepreneur and writer. She grew up in Brazil where she attained a degree in forest engineering and later completed a master's in holistic science in Devon. Morella has worked on various projects relating to environmental education, reducing waste and sustainable management of tropical forests. Currently she coordinates ShareShed, a library of things. And I can tell you, I'm super excited to hear about this project and how it's progressing. So welcome, Morella, to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's more of a pleasure for me, let me tell you. So uh, let's start by getting a, a feel a bit about you. You're originally from Brazil. So tell me a bit about your background and how the environmental sort of sphere came into your being and how you ended up in Devon. Yeah, so I grew up in Brazil in a, in a very big city where at the time my mom was now I have a, an appreciation for what the hippie she was in unusual in her ways uh, from doing recycling at home which was not at all a t- something that was mainstream not certainly not in that environment to incentivizing us to be mindful of our wastes, of our foods, not allowing us to eat sugar, and not allowing us to watch much TV. And, you know, make us, at the time it felt like almost an enforcement. She wasn't particularly popular with, between me and my brothers in that way. And now I can really appreciate how good her, I guess, ways of educating us you know using homeopathy uh, affected us in a positive way so i feel that we were very lucky even though we didn't have that awareness when we were little i due to some lovely friendships i was very privileged to have an opportunity to go to farms into the countryside which was again very unusual especially in that environment of a a city similar to Birmingham. Yeah, and I, and throughout that, I developed my love for nature and my awareness and connection, I guess, around it. And, and then I ended up, ended up studying forestry engineering, where I learned much more about, you know, climate crisis and about waste management, which became a real passion of mine. I studied in a in a great university in the south of Brazil where there were 30,000 students that ate every day in the refectory in the university that subsidized. And at the time, we all had plastic cups, plastic cutlery, salt and pepper in sachets, you know, so an absurd amount of waste being generated. And I was very fortunate because that I found that so alarming. And throughout the in in Brazil, university course usually take up about five five years. And throughout this time, I, along with some other people, we developed a project that meant that the year I was leaving, the whole refectory was redone in order to have reusable mugs, uh, real cutlery, salt and pepper in real containers. So I feel very, felt very proud for being part of that change. And, and also through my course, I had the opportunity to go to the Amazon rainforest where I had the most incredible time and it was a very moving experience yeah, in so many levels. Um, yeah, and I guess this is just to inform a little bit of how my passion 
an understanding of what I want to be doing, working with, ideally, uh, kind of where it came from. And and it's a long story, but I heard about this place called Schumacher College uh, by a magazine I read in Brazil. And at the time, I didn't know any English, spent a, a night copy and paste all the content on Google Translator in a very slow internet and, and became my dream to study there. It's a college uh, that was set up by Satish Kumar, who is an uh, Indian earth pilgrim activist, an incredible person who is very much influenced by Tagore, the philosopher, Indian philosopher, and E.F. Schumacher, the German writer who wrote Small is Beautiful. And along with the amazing thinking and experiences, him and all these people he brought together, Schumacher College was born 30 years ago, I believe. And yeah, in this tiny little town, it's, south of England and I was very fortunate to go there uh, 13 years ago studied holistic science which was one a uh, master's program and fell in love and have stayed in the area that's amazing a number of things struck me through that story one of them being that when you were at university and you're talking about the refectory it's so easy for us to accept things as our norm, but you obviously mm. didn't accept it as your norm. You did see it through different eyes, which I found really curious because lots of people would just go, well, this is what we do. This is we, we eat with plastics, we throw them away, but you really tuned into that. And you obviously clearly wanted to make a difference. And the other thing that really struck me through that storytelling is your your courage uh, and I wonder whether that came from your, your 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 mother in that you felt able to to sort of be part of change and then to make this massive move to a country where you you <laughs> didn't speak the language I think that's it's so interesting and that you brought all that wealth of experience from your 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 home uh, into your new home so mm. you're in you're in Devon you embraced it in every way by the sounds of it Tell me how you got involved with the share shed and how that story unfolded. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your kind words. I have to say I've also been very privileged in my life. So that's the combination of courage for sure and also opportunities that I've had the luck, I guess, to be presented with. Uh, really aware that, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of yeah, skills and willingness I just don't quite get the same opportunities, I guess. And as far as Shashad goes, so as I mentioned, I was at Schumacher. Uh, it was an incredible year, one of the best in my life. I fell in love with, with who is not my wife, and we actually got married, married at the college and decided to continue in this community because we've never felt, yeah, she's from Yorkshire. Right? And even though she grew up, was born there and grew up there, she never felt she belonged so much to a place like we, she felt here. And the same for me, that same thing. Even though I feel, yeah, a great longing to Brazil and my family, my friends, uh, it's an incredible place. And I'm just very unique. At the time, 2013, uh, there was this organization, which is a charity just being born, called the Network of Wellbeing, which is also uh, Satish Kumar, was a, a key person in order to make this organization happen. So as you can see, I've been you know, very much touched by Satish. He's, wonderfulness uh, in many ways and I was lucky at the time to get an internship there as a comms and events person and that's how it began and things evolved in a way that I at the time I set up <laughs> You know, by hearing talking with people in the community and hearing a lot from single parents and people who 
had just moved to the area. Bear in mind, like Totnes is eight and a half thousand people, so in the countryside, rural Devon, as you know, so in the it's winter and like there's not much going on between, yeah, just the cold and the darkness and how much one can afford to go out to a restaurant, whatever. There wasn't much going on. Uh, so we had this idea to have these potlucks, which call, we called community potlucks, like the bring and share meal. Everyone it was free. So all we had to do was to rent at the time a, a hall in a church. And we tried to make it nice, you know, they decorated and people brought whatever they could and yeah and the first event we had 80 people the feedback was lovely then we decided to run in the following month then we had 150 people and then that became a monthly occasion for about five years so this community potlucks grew uh, in an incredible way and was the most rewarding experiencing too in terms of connecting people from all walks of life in a very simple way you know sharing a meal and yeah it was very successful in a way that many organizations ended up coming to see us and taking these kind of we put together guidelines and people started doing that elsewhere and it's really nice in nowadays we, we eventually decided to, we tried to hand that to the community, but unfortunately it didn't work because it's simple and yet it, it takes, you know, a fair amount of work to to do that, especially regularly. But it, eventually we started doing something else and yeah, and still there is a culture here around potlucks. You know, a lot of organizations have AGMs with potlucks and it's interesting to notice that and it's lovely actually and and one of the things that have happened was that I had heard about a, a project called the share shop in Froome in Somerset that had been set up and I was really amazed by you know what they were doing which is essentially a library of things a place like a book library that you come and borrow tools, gardening equipment, household appliances, camping gear, musical instruments, you know, you name it. Things that, yeah, you might need just every now and then for a one-off job or something that you might want to try out before you invest in one, if it's going to make sense. And, and again, we were, you know, that's when, what I mean by my privilege. I was working in an organization, a role that there was that level of openness and autonomy to come up with ideas and for, for the team to say, yes, let's give it a go. And for the resources to be around it kind of thing. Um, and thankfully, National Lottery Community Fund has been also very generous with us throughout her journey in terms of backing up the project from the beginning. So we started out in a in a dump and cold garage that the town council very kindly let us use it free for free to give it a go for six months. And we put a call out, we run a you know community consultation kind of meeting in which we asked people if there was such a project, what would you like to borrow? Uh if there is anything, what would you be able to donate to the project? And would you be willing to volunteer? Kind of say, essentially, that was it, really. And their response was incredible. Like in, in about a month, we had 160 items. And these are all like stuff that's in good working condition because we didn't have, we still don't have really the capacity to repair that, you know, things. Uh, that would be the next step, ideally, to take things that need mending. Uh, and basically, that's the, that's the learning. You know, one is the abundance. At the time, there was a lot of fear around it. It's like, oh, people will steal things or they will misuse. You know, there's a lot of, uh, understandably so, like especially nowadays, uh, the culture of fear and the, the you know, and and that's been 
I guess one of the most rewarding learnings of these my job is to touch into the abundance, into the generosity, into the goodness among human beings. You know, this is all over the world, obviously, but it's just especially in the communities we are working with. And that's what's very kind of inspiring, I, certainly for me, and, it, and I'm sure for people I work with, generates a lot of hope. So it starts, started out in this tiny little place, uh, far from ideal, and things evolved. We moved to eventually the office we used to have, because the council needed that garage back. And, and what happened over time is that we realized a lot of people from other communities nearby were coming to us to borrow stuff. And, and just to be, be clear in terms of our model, people become a member, their membership in our case between five to 50 pounds for a year. And then they're entitled to borrow, borrow things. Essentially, we say borrow rather than hire because it's all not for profits. It's all, you know, there's a lot of voluntary work. And yet there's a cost, about 10% of the cost of the item. So if a, if a hedge trimmer is 80 pounds to buy one, you can have it for eight pounds for a week uh, so on a weekly basis just to explain our model because thankfully there are many many library of things popping up all over the world and, and also in the UK and yeah it's fascinating to see how everyone is different uh, which is great and in just going back to the what I was saying what happened was we realized well people are driving to us you know 15 minutes or 20 minutes to come and borrow an electric drill, which is one of our most popular items. And and on that note, I also had learned during the research phase that an electric drill is used on average up to 13 minutes in its whole lifetime. So the whole invitation was like, do you need a drill or do you need a hole in the wall every now and then? You know, that's that a kind of a very clear example of what is that what this is all about and in the time the lottery again they were doing a something called people's project an invitation for those who had been awarded funds before to apply and long story short we were able to get the funding to create what became the very first mobile library of things in the world, which was quite a extraordinary adventure for us to, to, to make it happen. And it evolved in a way that we have now this very, very beautiful and cool van that's all like, so, well, like with wooden cladding. So it's a real, we see a shed on wheels. And we have like a bus, but it's like on a weekly basis, we have a route. At the moment, we have seven stops in six communities. These are small towns in rural Devon. So, you know, it's really rewarding to support people who are, you know, more and more isolated, more deprived communities to have access to this kind of service. And yeah, and we are... We are we turned six years old a couple of weeks ago, and it's been a real joy. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Again, and a number of things struck me through that when you were were talking about it. The fact that you did some research to start with to work out exactly what your community wanted, and mm -hmm. then you obviously got this buy in quite quickly by the yeah. sounds of it. And I was interested in the fact that the mobile sort of side of things came out of demand rather than you thinking, oh, this is what we'll do. It sort of evolved because that's yeah. what, what people were sort of driving towards you. How did you decide on the location? And, and in was it simply those locations that were coming to you already that you decided to put on your, on your schedule? And how did that how did managing that process, because it, that's not an easy thing to decide when you're going to be in a t certain town, where you're going to park, that sort of logistics around that. How did that come about? 
Yeah, so in terms of the how we decided which communities to go to, it was a combination between needs. So for us, Buckfast Lee, uh, which is 10, 15 miles away from Totnes, it's one of the towns with the highest index of deprivation in the country. So clearly there is that you know need, sadly so. And then also the, the response we got from those communities, the engagement. So between the local authorities, like the town councils and councillors, for that matter, you know, reaching out and really supporting and saying, like, we want you here. Some of them providing some funding to support us with, because, you know, the reality is, it, as a business model, it just does not the masks just don't add up. We still very much rely on grants, no matter how much, you know, thankfully we are, we've are we been steadily increasing our income through trade. And at the same time, in terms of making it viable, and we have two part-time, I'm one of them, but I have a colleague who works also in the project and a team of 20 volunteers without whom, you know, we could not operate. So that's the the kind of challenge and built of these kind of things because on paper it does not make any sense whatsoever. The thing good is that there are foundations and you know lottery and many other supporters and trusts to back projects like that up. So I'm a great believer in like at least distributes the money a little bit beyond the, the profit line, you know, like let's support the communities. And then what was the second aspect of the, the questions? In terms of how you decided on your, which days you'd go, what time you'd go, oh, where you yeah. set up, that sort of <laughs> practicalities of actually putting it in, yeah. in place. So ideally, <laughs> all the places would like us to be there on Saturday mornings. That seems to be the most popular you know, time, bear in mind against rural, small towns, usually with a public market home. It obviously is impossible for us to do that. So again, it's a combination between what the opportunities were. So in Totnes, you know, we can, there's a public market that's extremely popular on uh, Fridays and Saturdays, so we can and location that's been one of our learnings. Location is key. That garage where we started out, as I was saying, it was incredible that we were able to use that for free, but it was not in the high street of Totnes. And just by being a little bit off, you know, when we eventually moved to the high street, many people said, Oh, I was meant to go there, but never made it, you know. Because in the high street, you can go and buy a Hummer just there. You won't, you, you know, go out of your way to when you can borrow one as such. So we learned how location was key. So that was, a, again, a, a priority of ours. Like, how can we have be in the prime space? So thought in this, because it's where we started, it didn't matter. Well, we couldn't really, there isn't space when the public, public market's on, but we are there here on Thursdays afternoons. So in in the best location in town, you know. And, and then again the council letters you use that place free of charge. So that's incredible. Uh in Dartington we part by school. So it's like oh let's be there open by two thirty so we can combine with school pickup in until four o'clock so people can either pick up before the get their kids or afterwards uh, so it's a combination of things you know there's in King's Bridge again we are right in the market square uh, and there's a mobile bank I believe that goes there so it's like oh let's do combine that you know so at the same time it's it's an evolving thing like in Ashburton, Burton where we go to it's very quiet because we are Again, in the art center, which is lovely, but it's not quite in the main, in the high streets. 
and and it's notable how much that affects you know the ability of people come and go in south Bright, we have the pop-up kind of post office happening simultaneously with this so it's like oh it's very quiet otherwise so let's go when people are coming to, to the post office that's open you know two hours a week <laughs> so that's what we do and and you know and that's on that note we we just started out trying this new system so there's now a community hub there that got set up recently and they said let's have a cupboard like a little cupboard here with a locker and then you can drop people can reserve items because we're just there two hours a week obviously it's such a tiny little window a lot and during working hours you know a lot of people like we can't be there even if we are willing to to do you know that but now we have this cupboard and then people can reserve things we leave the items there and then equally for them to return because the, it's a community hub there's always a volunteer there and they're all trying to really get the place going so they're opening a lot of hours so this is all to say that is is an evolving piece of work really yeah and oh that that really makes sense to be able to drop things off so people can access it mm. at different times and as you say, it's a kind of a, an organic developing yeah. story, which is great, depending on on your resources and the demand and just finding finding your way in terms of what works yeah. in, in terms of the people that are borrowing. Mm -hmm. Are they the, the people that you expected or is it right across the range of different socioeconomic groups um, and whether they're whether they're already on a sort of sustainable journey, is it? Are there certain types of people that you find have drawn to it, or is it quite mixed? It's a mix, and at the same time, there is the the majority of people of people are environmentally switched on and are in this kind of sustainability journey already. Middle class, uh, white, privileged people. So, and that has been surprising for us because, you know, that like there, there are a number of reasons why people use Library of Things. Um, certainly a combination between t living tiny flats and literally not having storage space for a carpet cleaner that you're going to use once a year. Uh, then there's the environmental aspect. People are just trying to reduce their waste and carbon footprint. Then there is the financial aspect, obviously. So people who cannot afford things otherwise. That's certainly uh, over joyful when we are able to support those who are struggling the most. Meaning, you know, we've recently had a couple who just moved to the town, moved to town as they were sharing, they moved to a house that needs a lot of work doing and they're doing them themselves and they have a little baby they've got this baby always with them and they came to us and bought like 15 items you know all from ladders to tape measure to electric drill and for obviously a fraction of price and and it was you know it then feels like so good to like we're doing something useful here because who knows i mean i hope i want to believe that they would be able to source those things from the neighbors otherwise whatever but you know it's very cool and they were so appreciative and delighted that they were like really excited about getting with what sounds like a very onerous diy project you know um so it's very great to be able to offer that service. And yet uh, there is some sort of bridge to be built, I guess, with those who are in most need. Because, yeah, there is something there that we haven't cracked, I have to say, six years in. It's still, yeah, an ongoing piece of work. You know, how can we support those who are in need the most. It's it's obviously ultimately it's great people are using library of things in their areas and reducing their wastes, no matter who they are. Uh, it's just about, you know, trying to make the most of this service. And equally, 
in, you know, we are running these events. We just had what we call the Share Fest, it just happened on Saturday um, in Totnes. And we are trying to kind of open up the whole agenda beyond repair. So, beyond sharing, which includes then repairing, making, and swapping. So, that also has been quite uh, an incredible journey. And having just run the Share Fest, and we had about 700 people coming through this time, which was awesome. And a whole day, like a day festival with, yeah, skill shares and talks and workshops and repair cafes. Yeah, basically, you know, like just supporting people to live and consume differently. And the fact, the reality is that either through, through choice or through needs, people are having to, to change, I guess. And yeah, and it's nice to be able to offer opportunities to do so, you know, to make life a bit easier. Because sometimes if people either want or need to get something repaired, so you take to a commercial shop, they will look at just like, it's not worth it. <laughs> you know, just go and buy a new one. Well, I haven't got the money to buy a new one, nor I would like to. So then there's, you know, it's, there's now the movements right to repair it, and if you're aware of it, that's the worldwide, like that pushing legis legislation to, so the manufacturers make things repairable. Apple, Apple being the craziest example, we you know that they, for each mobile phone that they launch, the, the charger looks differently. Even now the plug for the headphones differently, and so, beyond crazy this whole thing for sure and you highlight there the the local and the system don't you in that you can mm -hmm. you can highlight the advantages which are many as you've pointed out that it's it's financial savings and it's environmental uh, environmentally beneficial so there are so many wins to sharing but we're in a system that's it's all about buying the latest thing and then throwing it away when it doesn't work so that has also got to change but it's grassroots stuff like this that will also help mm. the system change won't it and For as sure. as big people either as you say by need or by choice are choosing a different way to have things or not own things that, that creates a different society. Can you see through the project that you're doing and the fact that you've just had this share fest, can you see a momentum building or is it still very early days? No, definitely. Oh, it's happening. It's happening. It's a, it's a slow going process and yet it's, it's totally happening and it's getting stronger and stronger. Like in Scotland and in Wales, they, the government is pushing support and so much of the sharing agenda is like so inspiring and yeah, it's mind blowing what they're doing there. You know, they've, they've got these goals. I can't remember now the numbers, but I think like in Wales to have 30 library of things set up in the next two years and they're funding it. They are providing lots of resources. Now they have launched recently an incredible website. They have a whole map. like. You know, and that's changing, happening in real life. And, and this is just a tiny little thing, you know, this mobile, like we, by being pioneering, let's say the mobile version of like things, we've had like people from all over, like little all over the world reaching out to us saying, how are you doing, you know, the pros, cons, challenges, whatever. And, and thankfully, there's there's one that got launched in North Wales recently. It's called Borrow Bus, a really cool blue bus. And uh, there's one in Birmingham being built by Active Wellbeing Society. And this, you know, this idea, the beauty of these grassroots, and this is just one example. There are obviously endless examples of. You learn, you see something working, and you it's like oh what's working here how can i learn from it and we see that very much part of our mission you know we, over and over again i have conversations with people 
we're thinking of setting up Libra of Things. She's like, just drop us an email, we'll share your questions. We're very happy to talk through them. Uh, we've got uh, webinars on YouTube if people want to check them out, you know, if they're thinking to have one in their communities because like, okay, let's make things, you know, shortcut. <laughs> don't need to rediscover the wheel. And at the same time, it adapt it to your context, to your people, to your culture, to your needs and wants, you know, and there is no rules around it. That, and, and that's so cool to have that level of creativity around it. There is innovation, each project doing differently. You know, London has a whole different model. They have this very high tech kiosk, user cards, and then the door magically opens and you get the item. You know, like great stuff, bath, they, they deliver things to the, your home in an electric bike that's run by volunteers, you know? Like, why not? And that's, that's what's so inspiring about these grassroots initiatives is to see change happening, like, you know, every day that I'm working in the world, because I do a lot of work on the computer, but it's so, it so refreshes that kind of motivation for me because it's like someone the other week was like, oh, just the off, the off chance you have a heat gun because I need, I'm doing this work in my door. I need a heat gun just for, just for 10 minutes. So do you have one? It was like, yeah, it's 250 for a week. The guy couldn't believe it, you know? Uh, and it's just like 50 like it costs I don't know f almost 40 quid plus you probably would what go on Amazon I mean being extreme but just like in a click away get to your door use for 10 minutes do your job and then it's what do you what sit in the garage or the packaging or the transport you know it's nuts so this is why it, it, we say it's all about access rather than ownership in the case of library of things all these initiatives, you know, repair cafes, obviously it's another one that's supporting people to get stuff made. It's, and teaching people how to do that because, again, uh, there's a kind of a generational thing. Usually men, retired men, you know, and, and then look at main sheds, also doing great stuff. Uh, how can we then teach the young generation to repair stuff? How can we teach women? to repair things how can women believe they can we can <laughs> repair stuff you know to begin with so, <laughs> absolutely so there's a, a real shift in, in culture and perception i guess that comes along with the practical change and that's one of the fabulous things about a library of things is is that it's so collaborative and so <laughs> i know by nature a library of things mm. is sharing but you're not trying to keep all these ideas to yourself. You're trying to just Definitely. get as yeah. many people on board as possible. And that is so refreshing in a society yeah. that is not necessarily geared up in that way and really bonding for communities, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so th there's just so many wins, but I can imagine it's also from your point of view, coordinating it. You could be at this 24 seven if you're not careful. Uh, <laughs> um, it's surprisingly much more work than I thought. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not a surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you see the future in terms of your own library of things within Devon? Do you see it as as it's kind of perfect modeling at the moment, or do you see it sort of moving again? Oh, never onwards? perfect. I always am perfectly trying <laughs> to do better. <laughs> yeah. We are the minute part of a group of people that's trying to set up a network of sharing libraries in the UK. So as I mentioned, it's, it's mentioned Scotland and Wales have a very established network with the government, very progressive government, let's add, backing that up. Uh, England's not the same. So we are trying to get that done uh, in order to, by having this English network, we then create a UK network in order to strengthen the movement and really support the change in, in that level of government and legislation and how things are manufactured. Uh, along with that, 
it's about between raising awareness, you know, for everyone and anyone. So we've been, I say we, and many, it's my colleague who is particularly skillful at going to school assemblies and getting the kids engaged in talking about, you know, how they can, sh what they can share, what do they have to share to begin with? Or was there any time you, you wanted to borrow something from friends, you know, just to have a go and play a toy, like to look at toy libraries, so all the baby stuff, you know, like this, and, and, you know, stuff that you, there's a lot of stuff that you don't need, but there's a lot of stuff that one needs for a baby from a sling to a high chair to, you know, a cot. But then, you know, babies are baby for a certain amount and then they grow and you know what happens with all that stuff. And yeah, so it's a real, there's a lot of potential there. Like, uh, I I don't, don't really like have specific plans for the share sheds that the minute beyond running this kind of events, like more skilled shares, you know, and repair events. And like we did at the Share Fest, we had a seed, seed implant swap, and we had a swap of the school uniform. Literally, like what it takes, uh, it's, it's a clothes rail and a sign. Put your uni the uniforms that your kids have grown out of and take what's would serve you like it doesn't get more simple than that you know so it's not from a good sign that way and yet sometimes just take someone to facilitate that and put these events together and like we had also a skill share on how to make those like bee wax food wrap you know so rather than using clean film to i don't know get sandwich and take it or just use, make this wrap that's really fun to make, and then you just wash it and reuse and reuse and they So, yeah, it's endless, the potential there. And another really great thing for us is that there are many communities around us that don't have a library of things and really could do with one. So, you know, and there are a few days that our van is just parked, which, we don't want to do, to be doing so. It's about making more bridges and more partnerships so we can support more people, really, elsewhere. And and ultimately, we want it to be made redundant. We want all neighbors and all family members and friends sharing their stuff, you know, and share what you have, and. Yeah, and, and live differently. And it's very joyful because then you get to connect, you know, with people really, really. And especially neighbors, it's such a, yeah, beauty where I live, there's a, a WhatsApp group. And, they, you know, them literally just a WhatsApp group with your next door neighbors or that's what it facilitates, like between people being unwell and needing someone to help to take the dog for a walk to someone going away and having a bunch of food that's totally fine to, to be consumed, but they don't want to put in a bin, you know, like, or like, oh, I need a lawnmower, my, I, you know, can someone lend me one like this? And that's all it takes, a WhatsApp group. Yeah, Absolutely. So. I think that's, that's a brilliant place to draw this in to a close because what you've said there is that you want to foster this sharing so it becomes second nature that everybody just mm -hmm. does without having to think i have to go somewhere i have to connect with a community group or I have to do. you just go within your local community and it becomes second nature i think that's a fabulous vision and i i hope that the share shared and the library of things is a part of that movement is driving this change where we see that actually being environmentally aware and sustainable actually has so many benefits it's not something we have to do that is difficult necessarily it mm -hmm. actually has lots and lots of wins so it's been such a great pleasure to hear the story locally and also your connections with the wider library of things community so thank you Varela, for for sharing that story my pleasure thank you for listening <laughs>
Living sustainably can sometimes feel difficult to navigate, but sharing stuff is pretty straightforward. Buying less benefits carbon emissions, air quality, and saves people money. A library of things such as the Share Shed fosters community cohesion, as Mirella's story revealed. It was fabulously inspiring. There's no doubt that system change is needed regarding designing goods to be lasting and be maintained. But these grassroots organisations push a society towards a different way of living. To find out more about Share Shed, take a look at the show notes. In producing this episode, I'd like to thank Andy Shaw for audio editing, Jeremy Jones for providing the music, and to you for listening. Don't forget, you can follow the podcast to get automatic access to each new episode. And it would be lovely if you could rate, review and share it too. It really helps. Until next time, bye for now.